Good morning and welcome to the third Sunday of Lent. And it is the first Sunday in March, so we will be celebrating communion. If you'd like to pause it uh, and go get some food and drink, some bread and wine, uh, whatever you'd like to celebrate communion with, I invite you to do that now, or you can pause it at any time, obviously, during the service and uh, make your preparations for communion as well. But we celebrate that as the first Sunday of the month. I remind you that at First Congregational Church, that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And I invite you into this worship service to be in the presence of God, to make this a holy time and a holy space for yourself uh, to experience God's love anew. Let us now settle our hearts and minds in God's presence as we listen to the music of the prelude. And our study for Lent is the poetry of Lent, and it's featuring poems from the poet Mary Oliver. And so I'm going to share with you one of those poems uh, to begin our worship today. It's called Mysteries, Yes. <clears throat> Truly, we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of the lambs. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity, while we ourselves dream of rising. How two hands touch, and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always, from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look and laugh in astonishment 
and bow their heads. And now I invite you to be in the spirit of prayer as we pray together. Let us pray. God of abundant grace, may your Holy Spirit be with us now as we worship you this day. Open our eyes to truly see one another, that we might discover your presence in the smile of a neighbor. Open our ears to the needs of the world, that we might hear your wisdom in the words spoken around us and open our hearts to your grace and love, that we might find guidance and strength for the journey for ourselves and for one another. Amen. And now I invite you to listen and to sing along to the very familiar hymn, Amazing Grace, and let us enjoy this wonderful music. Our scripture lesson today comes from the 15th chapter of Luke. It's a chapter full of parables that all relate one to another, but all have uh, their own independence as well. And so we hear these parables that are shared uh, to a particular people, and I hope that you uh, find meaning in them. It reads, Now all the tax collectors and sinners 
were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her neighbors and, and friends, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property which will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger." I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put on a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine, which was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, who killed the, you killed the fatted calf for him? Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of God for you.
God's people. Amen. There's so much to be said about these parables, and I could probably treat each one individually and go on a long time, but for your sake and for mine, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I do want to speak a little bit to this last parable, and in this case, I'm going to call it the parable of the elder, the, of the big brother, or the pel- the pair, if I can speak the words, or the parable of the prodigal, uh, not the prodigal son, the parable of the elder son, uh, the big brother, the elder son, and feature them because it's in the context of the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling about Jesus that these parables are told. They resent that Jesus is hanging out with sinners and tax collectors and eating with them, and they don't think that's appropriate. So I think their role in this parable would be that of the elder son. Uh, And for us as well, I think we really are elder sons. We may have had a time when we were the prodigal, when we came back and discovered again God's grace uh, because we had lost it uh, and because we had become lost. And now we came back and discovered the wonderful and amazing, abundant and extravagant grace of God that was offered to us. Uh, But now I think if you're listening to an online version of worship, you're an elder son too. Uh, You, like me, are one that understands uh, how good it is to be part of God's kingdom how good it is to know that that father is loving and uh, has an abundant love and an extravagant love that we enjoy and that we are part of a loving community. Uh, We, through the years, through maybe from our upbringing, uh, maybe with some pauses here and there, but we, for the most part, enjoy a loving Christian community. Uh, We've been part of that. We celebrate that. We long to be with that community again. And in the meantime, we worship like this, apart uh, but online and joined together in heart, uh, just as we continue to be joined with God in heart and soul. But that places us as the elder brother, as the one that's in God's presence, and now may look askance at those who have been somewhere else and may be coming back and are treated above what I think their, or we think their station should be. Uh, they're treated as heirs to the kingdom, as brothers and sisters, rather than as even they think they ought to be treated as a hired hand, as a servant, Uh, And so we think maybe they're above their station and we resent that. But the problem then is ours. Uh, All these years, maybe working in the kitchen, maybe working at every church supper, are we doing that because we love this community, because we love our church and we want the best for it? Are we doing it out of duty? Oh, we've got to do this again. We've got to earn some more brownie points because if we don't do it, God will be angry with us or God might kick us out altogether. So what is our relationship to the church? Is it a relationship of joy that we know an abundant and extravagantly loving God whose grace knows no ends? Or are we one who sees a, a miserly, Father, who gives out begrudgingly and only when we've earned it and only to those who've earned it. What is our perspective on this? Clearly, the elder brother, the scribes and the Pharisees uh, saw it uh, as as the uh, limited God, the limited love, and they are the ones on the inside. Uh, had the experience a couple of weeks ago of working with our food truck. We do it monthly. And I think that's just a great opportunity. We're there and we're giving away somebody else's food. I mean, what greater privilege is there than that? Um, this food has been donated by uh, people throughout Connecticut, either through the month financial gifts that they give to the Connecticut Food Bank or through uh, food donations that we may give to Lent that end up with the Connecticut Food Bank, that kind of thing. Or many of these are simply donations given by, say, Stop and Shop or Whole Foods from their surplus 
uh, and are given to be handed out to those in need. And so we just get to be the conduit. You know, we receive this abundance of food, over four tons of food uh, and on that day, and we get to give it out. Uh, it's a great privilege, and we understand that we didn't provide that food uh, directly. Uh, it comes from others, and we just get to be the ones that give it out to those in need. Well, this past month, we had probably the most unusual item to give out, uh, and it was cans of margarita mix. Uh, and we, you know, as volunteers got a chuckle out of that, uh, we were teasing the Eastern students there who were uh, underage for drinking. And so, uh, you know, oh, you can't have this because you're not old enough to have it yet. And the beverages came with a, a virgin recipe on the side as well. You didn't have to use alcohol with it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it just uh, resulted in some kidding among us. Uh, but there was also some hesitance in it as well that uh, we thought, well, maybe we shouldn't be giving this out. But I think with that comes our own judgment. Uh, there may be some judgment. Oh, if they are poor, if they're in need of food as a supplement to their income, they must be alcoholics. Uh, so we shouldn't be giving them this. But that's not true. Uh, that just because you lose your job, just because your job doesn't pay a living wage, doesn't mean that you're an alcoholic. And the volunteers recognize that this might be something fun for us as volunteers to have. Wouldn't it be great to take this home, uh, to have it as a mixer and just to have uh, a fun time? But somehow it's different giving it out to somebody in need. Oh, they should be such so much more serious about life itself because they are in need. They shouldn't have the opportunity to celebrate like we might celebrate and treat ourselves with a margarita. Uh, that somehow we suddenly become the big brother, uh, the elder son, uh, looking askance at these people in need. They shouldn't get this margarita. They should never have fun. Uh, you know, that's for us because we've earned it, uh, because we are self-sufficient. Uh, and so in this simple example, you can see how we fall into that. Judging these others, we deserve it. We've been doing it and they don't, uh, because of whatever we look at them differently. Uh, and that I think is the challenge of this parable to understand that we are part of a church, that we are part of a faith that we are children of God simply because of the abundant and extravagant love of that God. And we have so much, we get to give it away because God gives it to us in abundance. And th that is a joy. And to understand our faith is a joy because we live in the presence of an abundant and extravagantly loving God. And that for the, everybody else, we are not to sit back and judge them. They don't deserve it because we don't deserve it either. It's simply the gift of God that we receive and they receive it in the same way so that we all deserve a time to celebrate from time to time and to have a wonderful time and to know the goodness of life because that is what God wants us to know. And we can see that in the sinners and the tax collectors and the poor and the needy and ourselves, that we are all children of God and to know first and foremost that this is a God who's not stingy and waiting to judge us. This is a God that welcomes each of us home and welcomes us with an extravagant and abundant love. And may you know that first and foremost, and may it be out of that knowledge that you act in this world. Amen. And now I invite you to be in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we are your children by your grace, through your love, and you offer us a love that is extravagant. And as we grow in faith, 
we know that nothing in this life and nothing in the life to come can separate us from your marvelous love. May we be people of joy because we live in your love and through your love. And may we be a generous people because we are merely passing on what you give us in abundance, love and grace, forgiveness and acceptance. And as we receive it, may we also pass it on to others as well. Bless us to be your people. And may we celebrate the love that Christ has shown us by affiliating with all people. And now we pray as he taught us saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to uh, consider your offerings for the church. We bring our offerings in this holy meal of bread and wine. And we bring our offerings to support the work and ministry of the church as well. We celebrate these gifts. And as you consider your own giving, uh, I invite you to enjoy the music of the band as well.
And now we are welcomed to this table. And how we perceive this table also reflects uh, whether we're being the elder son again. Are, is this a table that excludes others? Or is it a table that welcomes all seeking God's love to share in this holy meal? For us as a congregation, it is a la the latter. All are welcomed at this holy table. And do we think of the bread and the wine as uh, just the scraps that we receive off of God's table because we are no more worthy than a dog? Or do we see the bread and the wine as a foretaste of a great heavenly banquet that we will share with everybody gathered with Christ as the host and overflowing with food? Uh, in abundance that we get to share. And this is just a reminder of what we have to look forward to. Again, I invite you to see it as the latter, as a table of abundance where there's more than enough and it anticipates the great gifts of God for our life in this life and in the life to come. And that imagines a great heavenly banquet it is overflowing with the abundance of God. These are the gifts that we come to share. We remember most of all that God gave us Jesus, his son and our savior. And so we come to follow him as disciples of Christ, as we now follow him toward Jerusalem and his ultimate end and his ultimate gift to us. And as we share this meal, we give thanks to God for this bread. And as we break it, we remember that this is the body of Christ broken for us. That Jesus took this bread, gave thanks to God for it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to you, O God. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so may these gifts of bread and wine, of food and beverage, be the gifts that bring us again the presence of Christ, that renews us, that reminds us the abundance of God and invites us to be God's holy people, made one in the bread and through the cup. May we be God's people. This is the body of Christ shared for us. We are one in this body. This is the blood of Christ poured out for us, bringing us God's reconciliation. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are grateful for these gifts, for all the abundant gifts that you bring to our lives. May we have eyes to see your abundance all around us, for the love that sustains us, that we receive through others and through your good care in our lives. May we know that through these elements, common elements that we share at each meal, we receive again the presence of Christ to nourish us and to lead us. 
And may that be a gift that we share at each meal in your abundance. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now as you go, may it be the abundant and extravagant love of God, the beautiful grace that is offered to each of us from Christ, and the unity of the Holy Spirit that goes with you now and always. Go in peace. Amen.